full live. Oh, right. cool. Hello, everyone. This is Eric Vansick reporting for Waverly Newspapers. Anelia Dimitrova is near next to me, too. We are talking with Democratic State Auditor Candidate Rob Sand. Uh, uh, welcome, welcome to Waverly. Thank you, Eric. And yeah. you're from... And you're originally from Decorah, which has yeah, a bit of a history right. with that's Waverly right. because that's of the, right. the luther Warper rivalry. That's right. I did not go to Luther. Uh, my parents did. My dad grew up in Decorah, and so all of his brothers and sister went there. So we do have some strong Luther ties, but I can claim neutrality in that one. Mm -hmm. I'll be the Switzerland. Uh, yeah, because you went to Brown, because I understand you went to Brown University. That's right. So. Yeah. So uh, I was reading over your... Uh, uh, reading over your bio a little bit and say what didn't say what you uh, got your degree your bachelor's in at, at Brown political science but poli sci okay I, I nearly did an education program um, but the farther I got into it after a certain point I found out that out of the 44 states I was going to get certified to teach in it did not include Iowa Minnesota or Wisconsin mm -hmm. and if I was going to go home it would have have to have been in one of those three that's the tri-state area for decora so mm -hmm. i ended up doing political science and going to law school mm -hmm. so and it's and then you went to the university of iowa for law so right. uh felt uh, uh, iowa gr undergrad here so right. uh so uh, okay. uh, so, uh so what what did you uh, like about uh about uh, the ui uh i really enjoyed uh meeting a lot of other students from all around the state and getting to be at school in Iowa for part of my higher education. We actually have uh, one of the top uh, public law schools in the country in Iowa. And I had a scholarship there, so I very much enjoyed being able to go and graduate without debt. Mm -hmm. I actually chose to attend Iowa for law school, uh, despite having been admitted to Harvard Law School. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew I was ready to come back to the Midwest and, and wanted to be here and focus on public service work, which normally doesn't pay too well. So. A debt-free education was a good opportunity for me. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your, uh, I see on your uh, brochures you have um, some of your highlights, of course, is the uh, investigation and prosecution of the fraud-related um, issues uh, related to the Iowa Film uh, Tax Code Program. Sure. I'm very curious about this. What exactly was your role in it? And sure. And for, for a young person like yourself, it, I'm sure it was a big... Um, big case. It was. It, it was very uh, interesting that I was able to do that straight out of law school. Mm -hmm. Those cases had just barely been getting started when I graduated and the Attorney General's office had some funds from the Iowa Department of Economic Development to pay for a new prosecuting attorney to assist Deputy Attorney General Tom H. Miller with those prosecutions. So same name as Attorney General Tom J. Miller, different person. Uh, Tom H. is a Republican. He is a Deputy Attorney General. And he was Chief Prosecutor on those cases when we started. <coughs> but he and I prosecuted them together. I worked on the investigations and, and putting the cases together. And by the final prosecutions, uh, I was doing most of the work in the courtroom. And so Tom and I tried about four trials together and worked on all of the other uh, cases as well. It must have been very exciting, quite a unique opportunity for a young lawyer to get his hands into something like this, so thick. It was. And so high profile. It was, it was. And Tom uh, was very supportive of me, even though he was a Republican, uh, is a Republican, and I am a Democrat. He's someone that saw that I was ready to be in the courtroom and that I was ready to handle those cases. and. Uh, let me go. Let me do it. And we had a great time together. He was a great mentor, and I learned a whole lot from him. And another, and another thing uh, to, to, <clears throat> to get off of that, uh, uh, you also were involved in the hot lotto uh, fraud right. cases, and it ended up being like five different games that that's right that uh, what that you guys exposed uh, that were that uh, miss uh, that he had uh, uh, had rigged there. Uh, what was that? That's what right. was that like? Uh, so that was another case that started with Tom, uh, again, Tom H. Miller, Deputy AG. He was retiring from the Attorney General's office and handed me what at the time was a pretty thin file, and we didn't really expect anything to come of it, but he said, I trust you to run out the rest of the leads that we have in this case, and then put it to bed, assuming that nothing was going to come of it, which that's what I thought too. I thought nothing was going to come of it. But we did what we needed to do so that assuming that we put it to, get to bed without having anything, we knew that we had done our work. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, that, that thread that we started to pull, we just kept pulling and pulling and pulling over the course of years. And more came and, out and more came out. That's right, and ended up uncovering the largest lottery rigging scandal in at least American history. Mm -hmm. 
that was absolutely fabulous. I, I think in terms of how it how it turned out, in terms of being able to nab all the people yeah. across state lines, we covered that story. Um, I remember very clearly, mm -hmm. and and every every twist and every turn made it more complicated. There were a lot of twists. And I, know, yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. It's, I know. Especially when you when you're dealing with with computer software. That's in right. multiple states. That's right. So you, right. you really matured very quickly as a lawyer. Very, mm -hmm. very quickly, like on the job, trial by fire. Exactly. No, no, no honeymoon period sitting no. in the office. No. 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 And, and uh, credit and recognition is due to my colleagues who work in the Area Prosecutions Unit in the Attorney General's office because the place, that unit, uh, where I was for seven years gets a lot of the hardest cases in the state of Iowa. Mm -hmm. We get um, complex financial crimes, but we also get difficult murder cases. Mm -hmm. We get difficult uh, child sex abuse cases. And mm -hmm. we often uh, are trying cases because it's the right thing to do and we're less mm -hmm. concerned about whether or not we win or lose. Mm -hmm. um, the people that are in that division, uh, I was the youngest person there by about 10 years uh, at least. But they are career prosecutors, they work very hard, they care a lot about what they do, and they spend a lot of time on the road away from their families. Do it. Very yeah, we've worked service. with a lot of those people, I know. I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, the, for the coach, um, Coach Thomas's um, Yep, um, that would have been Scott, uh, Scott Brown. and Andy. Yep. Scott Brown is his name. And Andy Prosser, Andy Prosser I think. And Andy Prosser, well. yeah. right. Right, and, and I've worked with some of the other ones over the years. Um, oh, yeah. So, so... Um, Tell me just a little bit about uh, about yourself in terms of character revealing um, sure. a story while you're the youngest guy working there. You have all these experienced people working right. around you. Um, how did you handle that? Do you take advice well? Do I take advice well? Um, I think it depends. Sometimes yes and spoken sometimes like no. Spoken, well, like spoken like a lawyer. Well, I have spoken like a lawyer. You know what? Uh, a good example from, I'm trying to think of something from this campaign where I've been very deferential. I don't know anything about television advertisements. Television advertisements are an important part of a campaign. I'm working with a guy that knows a whole lot about it. When he tells me something, I ask him questions, and then I say, okay, you're the guy, you know. Now, when I was working with other people in my office, even though they had much, many more years of experience than I did, uh, sometimes I took their advice and sometimes I didn't, but fundamentally it would come down to, I know my case best. And I know myself best. And so you have different attorneys who have different styles in court. Mm -hmm. And something that might work for one of my coworkers might not necessarily work for me. Mm -hmm. And so I would hear uh, advice from folks. And I would, ha having shared a little bit of the case with them. But it might not fit with the rest of the case. And, or it might not fit with me. And so there's different circumstances where sometimes you, sometimes you need to and sometimes you don't need to. Describe your, your courtroom style. I think that's really important. Especially as you venture into politics. I, I'm sure you're taking some of it with you. I absolutely am. Um, again, I had a great mentor in Tom H. Miller, and he and I, one of the reasons I think that we uh, melded well in a courtroom is we have similar styles. I try to be very polite with people. I try to be very uh, honest and credible. And when I put on a case, I'm doing it because I'm confident that it's true. Uh, I'm not trying to stretch things. I try to treat people with uh, politeness. And if I can't get politeness back, it usually doesn't change the way I respond. Similarly, in this uh, campaign, uh, I've introduced myself to my opponent. We've met a couple of times. I think she's a very kind woman. I told her, if I say anything in this campaign that you think is false or that you think is wrong, please call me and tell me. I gave her my phone number uh, because I do not want to make my campaign about anything that isn't accurate. Because what I know enough about the state auditor's office, I think I can win based off of only what I know to be accurate. So how do, how do you transition from being uh, an assistant or, or, or assistant in the attorney general's office to state auditor? Because they seem to be two different career tracks. And for most people in the state auditor's office, this is a KWWL. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you were you were saying about the uh, oh yeah is the, it a different track? Yeah. So here's the thing. What most people don't understand about the state uh, auditor's office is they actually perform Iowa's public corruption investigations. Those are law enforcement investigations. By law, when they're finished with them, they don't give them to a, a law enforcement investigative agency. 
they give them to a prosecutor. They send them to the county attorney and to the attorney general's office, where most of them fall on my desk. Mm -hmm. So a lot of attorneys, most of the attorneys in the attorney general's office, it would be a very big change. But I've been working with the state auditor's office for the last seven years, the whole time I've been in the AG's office, and that is the number one reason that I wanted to run. Uh, I like the people that I work with, and they are talented people. And they care a lot about doing by, right by Iowa's taxpayers. But here's the thing. They are all, every one of them, CPAs and accountants. Now, I'm not here to tell you that lawyers are better than CPAs. <laughs> but I am here to tell you that lawyers and CPAs together as a team are better than either of them on their own. I see the investigations uh, that they perform. And when they are more complex investigations, they simply don't do them with law enforcement experience and it shows. It doesn't mean that they are doing it wrong for the way a CPA does it. But these investigations are supposed to walk into a courtroom and be ready to go, and a lot of times uh, they aren't because they're not being built by people who know uh, what it takes to have those investigations hold up in a courtroom. So basically you would try to maybe to diversify the auditor's office to include attorneys and not just the the accountants. And I wouldn't say attorneys, specifically criminal prosecutor. You want to have someone in there who works on criminal prosecutions, who knows their way around. It doesn't necessarily have to be a prosecutor. It could be a former cop. It could be a, a, a former DCI, Division of Criminal Investigation agent. Mm -hmm. But you need to have someone there that on day one of every investigation can say, hey, don't structure your investigation that way because that's not going to work in a courtroom you need to do it this way instead. Because if they are working together that whole way through, that's gonna be much better than just having the CPAs and accountants finish the investigation and then hand it to law enforcement, where law enforcement will look at it and say, I wish we had had someone involved with our background from day one all the way through. What would you do differently than what is currently the practice besides what we just talked about? So the first thing I would do in the office is uh, automate the process for putting bank records into spreadsheets. Right now, if they want to investigate and, and manipulate bank records and look at them in a different way to see what might pop out, if they want to analyze them, they're literally re-entering every number with their fingers one at a time. Oh, on their it's very cumbersome. It's extremely cumbersome and extremely inefficient. Prone to mistakes. To Prone well. to mistakes. In the office, by the way, that's actually responsible for promoting government efficiency across the state of Iowa. It's a very easy fix. All the people in that office deserve to be putting their time to better use because they're talented people who can do more than that. And that's the first thing that I would change. It would be an easy change because the only person whose permission I believe I would need would be my own. But there's a lot more than that. This office, uh, when, I, when I thought about making the switch, uh, the biggest thing that motivated is what we talked about already, the public corruption investigations, because that had been my interaction with them. But I read... Uh, about the office to see what else it was that they do. Turns out they're also supposed to provide efficiency recommendations. So every time they audit Waverly, every time they audit every county in the state of Iowa, they can actually offer them ideas for better ways to provide basic government services, things they can do to save money. Mm -hmm. They don't. In the current state auditor's press release announcing her re-election campaign, out of over a thousand audits performed, only several had efficiency recommendations. That's it. And if you haven't noticed, our state budget right now, not in very good shape. Mm -hmm. Our county budgets, our city budgets, they're all gonna be decimated. Because even though that uh, commercial property tax back, uh, backfill didn't go away this year, the reason it didn't go away is because uh, the people in charge know that it's an election year. And they're more concerned about uh, holding on to power, it's going to disappear. And if we are not doing work that we can do to save money at every level of government in Iowa by being more efficient, uh, then we're being foolish. Yeah. So you married, I see on your brochure, you have two kids. Mm -hmm. Beautiful kids, right? Let me Thanks. Just... The bigger there, one is there they are. and the little guy is Axel. How mm -hmm. did you and your wife meet? Backyard barbecue in uh, Des Moines. In Des Moines? Through a mutual friend, yeah. I was... Uh, in Des Moines that summer, studying for the bar exam to be certified as a lawyer. And our friend Katie uh, reached out and invited us, at, invited us both separately for this barbecue. It was at her parent, Katie's parents' house. Katie's parents were there. 
Katie and her boyfriend were there, and one other married man was there, and then it was Christine and myself. That was it. What does Christine think of your um, ambition to pursue a political career? You know, if you contrast it to the work that I was doing in the Attorney General's office, I had one of the few jobs uh, that probably you can leave to run for statewide office and have it be relatively less demanding. Like I mentioned, the people that I've been working with, Scott Brown, Andy Prosser, uh, they take a lot of time on the road, away from their families, year round. With this job, uh, am I in Waverly today? Yep. And I won't be home tonight to see my kids to bed. But I will be tomorrow. And when you're in a trial, that's a week at least, could be two, could be three, where you're gone the whole time. And you do that repeatedly during the course of the year. So to do a campaign once every four years, uh, relatively speaking, is not so bad. So uh, now, uh, how do you feel about the way the campaign is going? Because uh, I'm in doing research, I saw that you right now have about a three to one fundraising edge on uh, Ms. Moist uh, Mossman. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about the way that the campaign is going so far? Uh, you know, I actually have a question. Is there a way where we can also make this Facebook Live? This is Facebook this Live. Is Facebook but it's on yours. But I'm wondering if we can stream it also on yeah, our you own. Can, yeah. You can sh yeah. Did you share it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, share. You should have shared it in real time. <laughs> <laughs> We're yeah. learning. We haven't had anybody do a Facebook Live event. Well, so we didn't think we specialize it in this. This is yeah. our, well, this, I think this this is our bread and butter. Idea. It's a great yeah. idea. Uh, the campaign is going incredibly well. I feel really encouraged by it. Um, we in... The first seven weeks of the campaign raised more money than anyone has ever raised mm -hmm. in a state auditor's race. We have now done more than two times that amount. We have done it with nearly three times as many donors. And we've done it without any money from corporate PACs, which is something that our opponent cannot say. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been a good people-powered campaign. Uh, we've been working hard to do that. I mean, one of the ways we do it is we ask everybody to chip in, whether it's $3 or $5 or 500 Mm -hmm. You know, we have to have money to get our message out, and we're not shy about that. I'll add one thing, though, because mm -hmm. I think it's, and I, I think we should always be talking about this. It's silly that when you ask me how my campaign is going, or when you ask almost any camp candidate how their campaign is going, they are going to respond and talk about how much money they've raised. Mm -hmm. It's stupid. Mm -hmm. It's not what politics should be about. Politics should be about talking to voters, about ideas, about character. And it still is. But you have to spend so much time raising money that it's hard to focus on the more important pieces. When we uh, when this broadcast was paused a few minutes ago, I had a little uh, a technical glitch with a with an app popping up. But uh, uh, you said you you you're open questions for anybody who submits them. One of them, yeah. One of them might be thinking that your popularity so far might be uh, due to the fact that you look like an '80s movie star, Anthony Michael Hall from Sixteen Candles. <laughs> That's not the first time. That's not the first time I've heard the comparison. It's the first time I've heard the uh, correlation with the popularity of the campaign. Well, they just asked if they just said, ask him, does anyone ever tell him he looks like Anthony Michael Hall from the, that 16 Candles I movie? Have, I have heard that before. A friend of mine in law school, uh, Ryan, would give me a hard time about that. But it, it never took you very far, right? Your no. Looks, clearly, in the courtroom, they did not depend on your looks to... To, uh, to, you'd, to you'd, have to, you'd have to ask jurors. I don't think right. so. It wouldn't be an appropriate way to base a decision out of that. Uh, I think, if anything, people would tend to underestimate me because, I'm, because I look very young. Mm -hmm. I'm 35, I swear. <laughs> I could show you my, my driver's license right now, but that would probably have my uh, driver's license number. It would have my driver's license mm -hmm. number on it. I don't know if I want to show that to everybody. Tell me, um, tell me where this um, desire to serve the public comes from. Well... There's a couple parts to that. Um, fundamentally, both of my parents, I've always been civically involved. Uh, they volunteer in their community. They haven't been particularly partisan and they weren't really, I mean, they were politically active when I grew up, but weren't partisan. Um, I, I think family tradition is a piece of that. Uh, I also think that part of my desire to serve comes from my faith. Uh, but I had an experience in high school that was actually particularly um, important for me in figuring out what I wanted to do with my life. When I grew up in Decorah, uh, my first job was catching chickens and I like to hunt, I like to fish. But one of the great things about growing up in a small town is you can do that and yet you can do everything, right? So I was a skateboarder too. And my best friends and I would get kicked out of all the pop spots in town where we like to skateboard. Uh, and I got tired of it one day. I thought, this is silly. We ought to have a safe, safe place where we can do this. 
Property owners, I know, would like to make sure that all the skateboarders are not on their property. And so I spent two years, my junior and my senior year in high school, getting a skate park built in Decorah. Uh, they poured the concrete after I graduated, but that experience to me uh, was almost like finding a calling because I was able to work with people in my community that disagreed with each other, but who could find a way to agree that this was a good thing to do for the community. It made me feel good about my community because people came together to do something positive for everyone. It made me feel good about myself because I was serving, which I think we're all called to do in one way or another. And it was just, it was very satisfying. And I was good at it. The skate park got built. And that's important too. And I think that experience to me has always sort of aimed me towards a profession one way or another where I was serving other people. I know you're right in the in this journey right now and it may be some some somewhat difficult to reflect on it while you're on it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you could reflect on it, um, what would you like to tell your children when they're old enough to understand about your first um, your first foreign in politics? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, every once in a while, uh, I'll write my wife an email that's kind of like a letter to them. And I know that those in the past have focused on the idea of putting other people first. And uh, I have um, always had, and I think maybe it's because of that skate park piece, a positivity and a belief that we can do things better in the world. And the difficulty that I found at the Attorney General's office was in criminal prosecution, you can make things less bad, but you cannot actually make them truly better. There isn't anyone who is a victim in a case that I have prosecuted, or in any case that any prosecutor has ever prosecuted, who went over and says, I'm glad that this happened. I'm so glad we met. You are meeting people in the absolute darkest chapter of their lives, oftentimes. And it's difficult to do that work. Uh, I prosecuted probably 20 sexually violent predator civil commitment cases. Uh, it is very difficult to do that work. Uh, stories from those cases I've never shared even uh, with my uh, close family. But I hit a point probably six years into the job where I was said to someone, I am a happy, optimistic person because it's how I've always described myself. And for the first time in my life, the words came out of my mouth and just didn't feel like it was true anymore. And I think if I were looking back, explaining this shift to them, to my sons, the same way I do when I'm explaining to people who are curious, why would you run for office? That's part of it. I know this office, the state auditor's office, well enough to know that we can make a positive difference, that it can be run better. And we've gotten a lot of support from not just Democrats, but Republicans as donors and as uh, supporters because it's not a particularly partisan race. It's just a form of public service. I look at this office and I see an unbuilt skate park. Uh, it's an opportunity to do a lot of good for our state that any, everyone can benefit from. And it's not just making something terrible less bad. It's actually making something better. And I think that is an opportunity uh, that doesn't come along very often. Now I would be remiss to, to leave this be, but you mentioned the chicken wrangling. How was that as, as a job? And was that for the uh, the decor hatchery? It was not for the decor chick hatchery. Uh, they never handled chickens. They mm -hmm. just handled the, the eggs and the chicks. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually for Wapsie Produce. Okay. So technically the animals were capons, castrated male chickens. Mm -hmm. uh, it is extremely dirty work. We would drive a very big truck into a very big barn and turn out the lights because the chickens couldn't be, see very well. Mm -hmm. And then you'd essentially uh, walk around on the floor of the barn, picking up chickens by their legs mm -hmm. and lifting them up to the guys on the truck mm -hmm. repeatedly. And uh, if you were lucky, you might have uh, eight people that came out that night to do the work and it wouldn't take as long. And if you were unlucky, you might have three and you would be there uh, more than two times as long as you would otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, extremely dirty work. Uh, chickens have very few defenses and they are willing to use them all. Mm -hmm. And uh, my second job was at McDonald's. If you ever want to have a job that makes you absolutely pumped to work behind the counter at McDonald's, then uh, chicken kitchens is, or so, catching chickens is a good start. So I bet you never looked at KFC the same way again. 
I still eat chicken. <laughs> but it, I, you know, I think it is very good for people to know where the food is coming from, always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's just talk a little bit about some of the laws that have changed in Iowa that, as an Iowan, you definitely have an opinion on. Mm -hmm. One that is on the minds of a lot of people in Waverly is fireworks. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think should be done? Um, should it be the way it is, the way the law now reads? Should, should any changes be made? Where, where, what do you think as a parent, as a... Uh, or, sh or should they have or even should been... They, uh, should it be an even legalized in the first place last year? Right. Yeah. So I don't think that the state auditor's office has a lot to do with it, but I, I respect the that. question, I but I'm still happy to answer it. Right. Uh, <clears throat> when you put people on a four-part political quiz and you quit pretending that we all fit on this... Um, on this single spectrum of left to right, you know, liberal to conservative, and you start to factor in uh, whether or not someone is libertarian or authoritarian, I tend to actually be on the libertarian side of things. Um, that said, when someone exercising their freedom interferes with another person's freedom, um, you have to recognize that too. Uh, and fireworks do that. Uh, your freedom to enjoy fireworks infringes upon my freedom to enjoy a quiet evening in my home. It infringes upon my ability to have my dog or my children not be scared by a series of loud bangs. I wasn't supportive of the fireworks legalization for that reason. It's a very, uh, uh, shooting off fireworks very much infringes upon other people's lives in a way that they don't necessarily appreciate or enjoy. Um, so I wouldn't have supported legalization. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, somebody is asking, what do you think about the IRS will only targeting conservatives? But this is more of a federal uh, federal issue than it is a state issue. But uh, what, what, the, 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 and this is from, from the Obama era, sure. I believe. Uh, did I hear about that story to some degree? Sure. Uh, but it is a federal issue. And, you know, I'm a prosecutor. I'm accustomed to informing myself very closely before I make decisions about whether or not to indict people. And I don't think that I know enough about the actual details of that uh, to have an opinion about it. Which I'll add, I bet that a lot of people don't know enough about the details of it. Uh, you know, a lot of times we tend to read a headline and jerk our knee left or right based on the headline. I think we have to be all of us more careful with uh, our opinions and try to base them more heavily in fact than just sort of uh, cheerleading for one side or another. Tell me about the campaign. If you know, I, I know you put your heart and soul into it. This is your seventh interview of the day, and you're doing remarkably well, having Thanks. done six prior to that. Um, but as you mm -hmm. as you move forward, and and you just if we get to election day, and let's just assume the worst case scenario as a prosecutor, you I'm sure you play the options. You always look at right. win or lose, right? We always look at those two in in, in your line of work. Um, are you prepared for both? Yeah. Um, you can't walk into a courtroom and put a case to a jury without understanding that it can go either way. Uh, and it's the same for a trial. I, I, I don't like it when I hear politicians say, when I'm elected. No, it's if you elect it. And when you say when, you're sort of denigrating the role of the people and the voters in the process. And it's, uh, I think it's kind of a lack of respect for them, frankly. So yeah, people might, pick, might not pick me. Uh, that's okay. I'm not doing it because I need to see my name on a ballot. I'm doing it because I think I have good ideas for what we can do with this office that serves Iowans better. And if people disagree with me, then that's their right, and that's okay. Do you have? Do you think you have enough stamina to keep going? Absolutely. All the way to the end. It's not Absolutely. that far away, but still, yeah. seven interviews a day. Yeah. I, I know I'm exaggerating right now, but every day between now and November would be quite the marathon. I'm having fun. I'm enjoying this interview. I enjoy most interviews. It Honestly, uh, I, I've, I've always been a very extroverted person. So for me to get to travel around the state and meet new people and talk to them about actually making a positive impact for our state, not just a tug of war between which party should control this or that, but actually getting an office that's a little bit sleepy and, and waking up the watchdog, which is what we've been talking about because this office is supposed to be the state's watchdog, makes me excited. It gives me energy instead of taking it from me. Let me ask you something. You seem really very optimistic and, and full of energy and, and um, enthusiasm. And you did tell your opponent, you told us earlier in the mm -hmm. earlier part of the interview, that if you did something wrong or didn't have your facts straight, 
she should be free to should free, be feel free to call you right call mm -hmm. me on it right mm -hmm. so um in, invariably in, in one form or another in a political campaign there comes a time when when even the most well-intended person um, is forced with a choice is faced with a choice um, should they go negative in their campaign mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've thought about this what are you prepared to do and what are you not prepared to do where are you not going sure I think that's an, so that's an interesting question to ask someone who is a criminal prosecutor Right, my job for seven years is to get people, jurors like voters, to understand that somebody else did something wrong. Okay, and I think that contrasting yourself and informing voters about a uh, office isn't necessarily different than a case. You should be basing it in facts, and you should be uh, stating it in a way that's just very clear. Uh, I have had contact with my opponent multiple times throughout the campaign. I have criticized uh, the performance uh, of the office under her leadership, and I don't think that I've done so in an unfair way. I don't think that I need to do more than that in this race. I think that I have enough to run on based on how I would run the office as opposed to how she would run it, that that ought to be enough. I also don't think, I mean again, this is a state auditor's office, right? Uh, it's not a race that has a great deal to do with a lot of different divisive issues. I don't think that uh, either of us need to make each other out to be scary boogeymen that are going to uh, do terrible things to other people. Um, it's the state auditor's office. And it's a question of direction and where we want to take it that really determines, I think, the content of the race. Tell me one question that you would like journalists to ask, to ask you, but none of us has thought about asking you so far. Oh. Well, did you have a question, Eric? Maybe oh, no, 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 no. Get those, no. Eric. Well, you, 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 you can get back to that, get back to that okay. question. But what I was wondering was, uh, what do you think about the party, the Democratic Party, up and down the ticket from, from, uh, uh, from the four, four congressional candidates to, sure. to, uh, to, to Fred, Fred Hubble, to, to yourself, to the Gene, to, to, and down, down the, the, down the House and Senate yeah. races. What do you uh, feel about the? Uh, what, what do you feel about the chances uh, for your party up and down the ticket? I think it should be a good year for the Democratic Party. Um, I think that there's a lot of people in Iowa who like to split their tickets. And I think that's a good thing because it's a demonstration of their willingness to listen and pay attention to the voters rather than just, uh, again, you know, jerking either their left knee or their right knee based on their party affiliation. And I think this is a good year that it should be a good year for the Democrats. Uh, you know, when Republicans were elected and took control of the House and the Senate and the governor's mansion, people weren't shouting at them um, to eliminate public bargaining. People weren't shouting at them to eliminate, uh, change the way that they classify shoulder injuries for workers' comp, mm -hmm. for people who put their body on the line uh, to help fuel our economy, right? I mean, I'm a part of our economy. I've been working, but an attorney's work is very much mentally based and it's not exhausting my body in any way and it's a different system for people who have to actually have to work with their physical bodies that's much more difficult i don't think people were shouting at them to pass a massive investment cut uh, where correct me if i'm wrong my understanding is every night in iowa there are four state patrol officers on the road in the entire state of iowa and i think that's a huge problem we're not investing in education. We're not investing in public safety. We're not investing in recreational opportunities by ensuring that we have clean water. And the, the Republican Party likes to call these things tax cuts. Well, at a certain point, you can call it a tax cut. If the taxes are incredibly high and, ta and uh, let's say teachers are making $200,000 a year, $100,000 a year, and the marginal rate on your top dollar is 75%. Sure, you want to cut that? That'd be a tax cut. We're just gouging into services at this point, and it's our, it harms our ability to invest in our future. And I don't think the people were calling on them to do that either. Uh, and I think that they've overstepped their bounds. They've paid more attention to what people who write them checks want them to do rather than what Iowans want them to do. And I think that Iowans are going to hold them accountable for that this year. And so, what question did, did you think that would you uh, want that we could we should ask you uh, that we that 
we in the media, I should say, sure. hadn't, hadn't thought of before. And what would your answer to be to that? So, you know, I had a very good question uh, today. I think when we started, we were in Iowa Falls to start off today. We were in Hampton. 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 Iowa Falls was yesterday. Uh, I had a good question there. And it was, you know, how do you balance your party affiliation with the idea to be focused on the truth and focused on integrity? And I don't think that it's difficult. And it troubles me that we are in a political situation right now where we think that that's hard for someone to do. Uh, when I was in the Attorney General's office, I prosecuted Republicans and I prosecuted Democrats, and I treated them the same. You can find people, uh, talk to the Webster County Democratic Central Committee. Um, there was a person there who was their treasurer who was embezzling money from them, and that person will not be voting in for any Democrats in this election cycle because they have a felony conviction now. And I'm the one that prosecuted that case. This woman is in her mid-60s. Uh, she was on oxygen. It was not a case where a deferred judgment, which would have allowed her to keep her right to vote, would have been unreasonable. But I looked at the situation, considering the amount of money that she stole, and the fact that she stole it from people who were putting their money together as a unit to try to make an impact in the world, which is kind of a really terrible thing to do. And I said, the, the offer I'm willing to make you, if you're willing to accept it, is a felony conviction. That's an example of somebody who, despite their party affiliation, is putting the public interest ahead of it. And it shouldn't be that difficult to imagine candidates doing that. And I think we really need to get back to a time where more candidates are doing that. Make the best case you can make for yourself in the remaining 30 seconds that we have. This Why should people vote for you? Because this office is supposed to be the taxpayer's watchdog, and we are working to wake up the watchdog. It's supposed to do efficiency recommendations for local county and state government. It doesn't. Uh, it's supposed to be an independent voice on the state of Iowa's budget. Yet over the last five years, we have gone from a $1 billion surplus to a $100 million deficit. And yet every step along the way, the current state auditor has called that budget sustainable and called it balanced and responsible. And we are supposed to have a public integrity focus in that office on public corruption investigations that really needs to incorporate the investment, uh, the, the perspective of law and uh, in law enforcement professionals. And I think if we do that, we are going to be better off as a state because we're going to have an office that has the energy to do everything that it should be doing. Well, thank you for coming to uh, Waverly, Mr. Sand, and, yeah, so. and yeah. best, best of luck to you in November. And uh, with Anila Katie Dimitrova, I am Eric Van Sickle reporting for Waverly Newspapers. Bye, folks.